Stanford University. Wow, it doesn't get any better or bigger than this. Um, thank you, thank you, Howard. Thank you very much, Provost Echemendi. Thank you, senior class presidents. And thank you most of all, seniors and your families. Parents, I know what it's like to bring a child to this kind of event. Thank you for all the hard work that's brought your child here today. What a fabulous day. I am so honored to be here. Um, I'm also just as impressed as heck that seniors, um, 24 hours before you go out into the wide, wide world, what do you want to do most of all but have another class? Um, that's my kind of crowd. Um, I also think it's a, it's a measure of the kind of community that we have here and the affection that we have for learning and for learning together. Seniors, when I was tapped to give this lecture, I was asked to talk about uh, my research in a way that was similar to how I talk about it in my own everyday classroom. Uh, I've never lectured in a basketball court before. <laughs> um, you know, I, I play a little basketball, and I've definitely been schooled on the court. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's good. Um, but I've never actually tried to, to do something like this before. Um, how many of you have actually taken, I'm going to try to block this mirror, how many of you have actually taken a class with me? Excellent. Okay. So those of you who are raising your hands know that before we begin a class, I try to play a little music connected to the theme of that day's lecture. So on the way in today, you heard the Beatles' revolution. Today's lecture will be, in fact, about the technological revolution. The other thing we do is we greet one another. Now, parents, you may not, may not know this. Students in my class definitely do. I, I have a very firm belief that the classroom is a place in which everyone has to have a voice and in which everyone has to contribute. And so we begin the hour each time we get together by offering a greeting. And I'd like to do that today. Classmates who've been with me before, you know what to do. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, not sufficient. Let's try that again. Good morning. Ah, oh, there we go. Thank you. Class is now officially underway. So, as you'll know from the introduction, I study technology and culture. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in the technologies that we're developing, but I'm especially interested in the kinds of social visions that are bubbling up around emerging technologies. You know, every time a new device enters the American landscape, it brings with it a hope for a renewed American democracy. 120, 130 years ago, when the airplane came along, Americans across the United States hoped that the airplane would finally join us across great distances and allow us to become a more harmonious nation. And we imagined that at a global scale as well. We imagined that the airplane would finally connect us to people so far away and different from ourselves. In the middle of the 20th century, when the television came along, many imagined that it would help us become a global vision, a global, um, a global village. Um, then, in the late 20th century, when first the personal computer and then the internet and then the World Wide Web came along, we hoped again that they too would break down walls, walls between the powerful and the powerless, walls between the poor and the wealthy, and that they would help build a more intimate, more collaborative, more egalitarian society. These visions of what we can become as a society are as powerful as the technologies per se. They've dramatically shaped the world you're graduating into, seniors. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about the generation that brought us many of the visions of digital media that we share today. And that's the generation of 1968. Seniors, like you, the Stanford graduates of 1968 came of age in a world suffused with technology. Amplified guitars, it was such a good decade. <laughs> Portable stereos, the atom bomb, the birth control pill, and the psychedelic drug LSD. All of these had come into being more or less within their lifetimes. Like you, the generation of 1968 
faced a series of choices about how to live their lives in relation to technology. Now, I think their choices offer some powerful lessons for you as you enter the world this weekend, and I'd like to tell you about them. I'm going to tell you a story about the past, but I'm going to bring it back at the end into the present, so bear with me. The story begins right here, on this campus, in this valley, in this state. Now, sitting here together, as many of you know, we are within shouting distance of the buildings in which Sergey Brin and Larry Page first wrote the algorithms that have become Google. We are within a quick jog of the headquarters of Facebook. I'm pretty sure that some of you sitting here today will pretty soon be working here in the Valley, whether for a giant or maybe even a startup of your own. That's great. I applaud your ambition and the very hard work you've done to make that future possible. What you may not know is that Stanford is not only the center of a digital revolution. About 50 years ago, it was a center of the American countercultural revolution. Now today, most people remember San Francisco as the center of the 1960s psychedelic scene. Um, up on the screen there, you see uh, one of my very favorite groups, the Merry Pranksters. They were a psychedelic performance troupe from the 1960s. Some of the parents may remember them. Um, that's a multicolored bus. They're driving it through San Francisco. Um, they thought of themselves at the time as a little bit of LSD dropped into the city um, to change the minds of those who they encountered. Uh, you know, the 60s were really homed in many ways in San Francisco, and we remember it that way. The hippies of Haight-Ashbury, 1967 Summer of Love, The Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, Jefferson Airplane, they've all become part of San Francisco's lore. But in the late 1960s, the counterculture happened here at Stanford, too. This is the same Mary Prankster group, and that's Ken Kesey sitting in the front. Um, Ken Kesey is the author of One Flew Over a Cuckoo's Nest. Um, he was a Stanford graduate, a Wallace Stegner fellow in creative writing when he began his psychedelic adventures. That's Stuart Brand in the back in the white overall suit. Stuart Brand graduated from Stanford in 1960, stuck around a little bit, went on to found and, and run the, the signal publication of the counterculture, the Whole Earth Catalog. He, too, was a merry prankster. You saw him on the back of the bus a moment ago. Uh, the point is that the counterculture was all through this area, and it was also all through the tech world. Uh, you know, in the, early 60, in the late 60s and the early 70s, the worlds of high tech and the counterculture were entirely entwined here in Silicon Valley. Now, you know, a little ways from campus, we had the Homebrew Computer Club. This is where Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak first introduced the Apple One computer. Um, that's Steve on the left there. Uh, as you can guess from his hair, the Homebrew Computer Club um, had an awful lot of countercultural vibe. Um, it really believed that computers were a way to personal and social transformation. Just down the road in Menlo Park, around the corner from the offices of the Whole Earth Catalog, you could find the People's Computer Company. They were a group of long-haired hobbyists who were trying to figure out what to do with this new thing that would very soon be called the personal computer. Here at Stanford, 1968, uh, Doug Engelbart, the man who invented the computer mouse that we all use today, he staged one of the earliest and most important demonstrations of online communication, the kind that we all do every day today. And he hired Stuart Brand to be his photographer. In the late 1960s, ladies and gentlemen, it was as much the counterculture here in the Valley as it was the engineers and researchers who brought us the visions of technology and community that shape our lives today. Now, I'm guessing that you might think of the counterculture the same way I did when I started my research. I always thought the counterculture was one big kind of 60s movement. I thought that it was the kind of thing where you might march against the Vietnam War during the day, and then in the evening, go back to your house, listen to some Jimi Hendrix, drink a little wine, get up in the morning and do it again. In fact, there were two very distinct movements in the counterculture, and I'm going to call them the New Left and the New Communalists. The New Left did politics to change politics. They didn't like the Vietnam War, and so they founded groups like Students for a Democratic Society, um, and they drew up a manifesto 
outlining their plans. Over the next decade, Students for a Democratic Society and other groups like it worked like traditional political parties. They held meetings, they drafted platforms, they marched against the war, and they tried to change the minds of America's elected political leaders. The New Communalists took a different tack. They didn't like the Vietnam War any more than the SDS did or the New Left did, but they didn't think that politics was the solution to the problem. They thought politics was the problem. For the New Communalists, the best way to challenge mainstream war-making America was to leave it behind. They wanted to head, as they said at the time, back to the land and to build the kinds of communities they actually wanted to live in. And that's what they did. Um, you can see here, this is actually a, a, a commune called The Farm. Um, in the early 70s, Stephen Gaskin, the man with the microphone there, led, I think it was a couple hundred hippies out of the Haight-Ashbury. For two years, they drove across the United States in a series of school buses, only to ultimately settle on a farm in Tennessee where many of them remain today. Between 1965 and 1972, tens of thousands of mostly young, mostly white, mostly middle and upper middle class people launched the largest wave of communal activity in all of American history. They built somewhere between 2,000 and 6,000 communes in the United States. Some were in the mountains in Northern California, some were on the plains of Colorado and New Mexico, and there were some right here in Palo Alto and Menlo Park and around Stanford in the hills back behind. The Back to the Landers hoped to do two things. First, they hoped to replace traditional politics with what they called the politics of consciousness. And second, they hoped to replace the everyday work of doing politics with technology. For the new communalists, political parties, nation states, bureaucracies, and sometimes even law itself were a cage that imprisoned otherwise free individuals in a war-making nation. They wanted to turn away from all of that. The new communalists wanted to gather themselves into tribes of like-minded souls. They believed that each person's mindset could be the key to collective happiness. They tried to align their psyches, to get their heads together, as the saying went at the time, um, if it weren't so dark, I bet I'd see a few smiles on the older faces in the room. Yeah, yeah, hmm. <laughs> what they were hoping was that psychological harmony would actually lead to social harmony. Communities would simply organize themselves organically into a kind of new Eden, a more innocent, happier world in which politics and warfare had no place. Now, how would they achieve this new consciousness? Those of you growing up alongside the internet won't be surprised by the answer, technology. The new communalists were enamored of an architect and an inventor named Buckminster Fuller. That's Bucky there. Uh, <laughs> I, I love his bald head. Um, so, you know, Bucky was probably the only thinker over 30 whom almost all of the counterculture trusted. He was also the developer of the geodesic dome, which you see behind him. That's that style of building behind him. And he always appeared in this sort of very formal suit, and he very proudly wore his Phi Beta Kappa key down below. Uh, he's kind of a fun guy. Um, so Buckminster Fuller had a very particular idea about what the young Americans of his time should be doing. He believed they should go out into the world and be what he called comprehensive designers. That is, they should take the technologies produced by large American industries and turn them into tools in which to change their own local ways of thinking and, and living. The tens of thousands of Americans who headed back to the land took Fuller at his word. They embraced all sorts of technologies. The automobile, the hi-fi stereo, even LSD, as tools with which to transform their psyches. I want to show you what comprehensive design looked like on the ground. This is Drop City, one of the first and most influential of the communes of the 1960s. Uh, these strange spaceship-like structures are houses, and they're built to be like variations of the geodesic domes designed by Buckminster Fuller. Um, they're amazing. Those little colored, each of those little colored partitions that you see used to be part of the roof of a junked automobile. 
the founders of Drop City got themselves half a dozen axes and went to local junkyards and chopped the roofs off of automobiles. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this. I've never done this. But if you chop the roof off an automobile, that's a heck of a lot of work. So they chopped the roofs off these automobiles. Then they brought them back to the commune. And they cut them to fit the designs laid out by Fuller, and they tacked them together. Why was it so important for them to do this? Well, it's interesting. Drop City was founded in 1965 in Colorado by a group of artists and hippies. Probably their best known member was an actor named Peter Rabbit. Um, here's what Peter Rabbit said about the commune in 1966. He said, there is no political structure in Drop City. Things work out. The cosmic forces mesh with people in a strange, complex, intuitive interaction. When things are done the slow, intuitive way, the tribe makes sense. And that's where the houses come in. The houses were meant to be forward-looking, spaceship-like structures. In the view of the Drop City folks, square houses made for square people. Yeah, some of you are old enough to remember what square, when square was an insult rather than a geometric figure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if square houses produced kind of square, regular people, these houses were meant to put you in touch with the cosmic forces of the space age. The builders of Dop City hoped that the domes would help create the psychological conditions under which politics would disappear and only community would remain. And now we can start to come back to our own time. The vision that animated the builders of Drop City also lit up many of the heroes of Silicon Valley. Steve Jobs famously liked to remind audiences that he had spent a year on a commune and that it has changed, had changed his life. In fact, a few years ago when he spoke at Stanford's graduation, that's exactly what he said. And he talked about the whole Earth catalog at some length. The managers of the whole Earth Electronic Link one of the first virtual communities and an important prototype for today's social media. They were veterans of the farm, the commune I showed you earlier uh, where, with Stephen Gaskin out in the grass. Um, and even today, every August, more than 40,000 people, many of them tech workers from Silicon Valley, head out into the Nevada desert and build a temporary communal city called Burning Man. It's amazing. When Burning Man is underway, traffic in Silicon Valley drops by a third. This is why I want you to know this history. As we sit here today, we are actually sitting at the confluence of two historical streams. One is technological, and the other is cultural. We're living at a time and in a place where thousands of people once again believe that new technologies have the power to transform our psyches and the structure of our society. Once again, many are turning to technology in the hope of building a newly intimate, networked kind of community. When we take our iPhones out of our pockets, and even more when we turn to social media to connect with our tribe of friends and family, we are acting out a vision and a version of the communities of consciousness first dreamed of by the new communalists 50 years ago. And that's why I have to tell you what happened to Drop City and at other communes like it. It turns out that without explicit political structures, without formal laws and institutions, the communes collapsed. By 1973, all but a handful of the thousands of communities that had flowered across the late 1960s had withered and died. This is what Drop City looks like today. And that's not the worst of it. Communes were meant to free their members from the psychological and social constraints of the middle American suburbs. But before they collapsed, many communes replicated the racism and sexism of mainstream American life in spades. For all the rhetoric of free love and universal acceptance, the countercultural communes of the 1960s far too often became just as white and just as traditional in their gender roles as any redlined American suburb. The technology enabled politics of consciousness turned out to be a terrible way to govern. It simply offered no way, 
no practical way to talk about the distribution of resources or the management of power. Graduating seniors, this history presents you with a challenge. Like the generation of young Americans that built the communes, you are coming of age in a world in which millions of your fellow citizens distrust politics. You have gotten your education at a university that has done more than almost any other to create the digital technologies that so many still hope will bring about a more leveled, more flexible, more individually satisfying society. As you leave us this weekend, I urge you to remember the history of this place. I urge you to embrace the entrepreneurial zeal of the new communalists and to take up their mission of building a new and better society. I also urge you to avoid their mistakes. Do not trust technology to replace the hard work of politics. Do not seek only the company of those like yourself. Do not trust only in your tribe. Trust instead in the kind of community you can see right here, right now, in this basketball gym. If you look around, you'll see that as we sit here together, we are a community of extraordinary diversity. We come in every color. We come from every state. We come from countries around the world. Today, one out of every six of you who is graduating is the first in their family to go to college. And we're all here because 130 years ago, a railroad magnate and his family took the profits of industry and built something. Not a network, not a commune, but an institution. They put together a collection of laws and buildings that has outlived them by more than 100 years and that arguably has outstripped what had to have been even their wildest imagination. Graduating seniors, as you undoubtedly know, by virtue of your education, you are among the most privileged members of your generation. Like the generation that headed back to the land, you have an opportunity to embrace new technologies, to knit yourselves into tribes of your peers, and to build a world in your own image. I urge you to reject it. I urge you instead to reach across the lines of race and class, religion and geography, that divide the United States and indeed the whole world. I urge you to embrace the hard work of politics, and I urge you to embrace technology too, and to use it to reinvigorate the institutions on which, in an era of global warming and global conflict, all of our futures depend. I urge you to bring into the world both of the visions that animate what will very soon be your alma mater. I urge you to embrace the energy, the commitment, and the raw creativity of this entrepreneurial valley. And I urge you to harness it to help build the kind of diverse, egalitarian, and mutually supportive community we share in this room today. Only then, seniors, can you have the kind of truly countercultural impact for which you have been trained. Class of 2014, congratulations. And good luck. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.